this is the day one for the financial reporting revision session first of all let me tell you about uh, the syllabus areas of financial reporting then we will start discussion of uh, today's agenda so first of all under this paper that is the financial reporting exam the most important elements that you have to cover in order to pass this paper is first of all the group's financial statement and in the group's financial statement there are basically three elements one is you need to prepare the income statement of the group as well as the consolidated statement of financial position and some changes in equity element not changes in equity rather some disposal of subsidiary calculation so you must be familiar about uh, the all the aspects of consolidated financial statement you might get a 20 mark question or a part 10 mark question on this topic so your consolidation must be very good in order to pass this paper the next one that you have to consider is the ratios and their interpretation which is one of the most challenging topic for the students especially when we talk about the interpretation of the ratios that the ratios that you have calculated you have to compare it with the last year or the industry average with the competitors and you have to analyze and comment on that the third area that is the single company financial statement again a one of the difficult areas and in this single company financial statement we have to prepare basically three statements one is the income statement and other is the sfp and the third one is the statement of changes in equity and what why it's a challenging topic is that you have to prepare all these with the help of the adjustments of ias and ifrs so without knowing without understanding of the ias or ifrs it's very difficult to get marks in this question three these three are the most important areas and in order to support these areas we have in the syllabus the ias and ifrs and we have a list of ias and ifrs the most important one i'm writing it here is is 12 which is taxation next one is is 16 property plan and equipment is 38 intangibles we have is 36 that is impairment of non current asset and similarly we have is 32 and ifrs 9 that is the financial instrument how to deal with financial instrument along with we have ifrs 15 revenue recognition and ifrs 16 that is the leases these are as as compared these are to me all are the most important ones and along with we have some is like 37 is 10 is 21 so they might be asked in the question so this is what the major portion of the syllabus that you need to work out in order to pass the exam and in order to have some good score on this exam mind you that uh, this is not a difficult paper but the students sometimes feel a tough time in this paper and they might not able to get the pass so in the revision session i will try to discuss the theoretical areas the numerical aspects the ias the consolidation and i i will try to write i will try to solve few ratios interpretation question as well 
so the agenda is to focus on consolidation so focus on single company financial statement the interpretations of ratio and to discuss the majority of the accounting standards which are considered as important accounting standards now as far as the paper pattern is concerned it's very important that you should familiar with the paper pattern and you should know from where to start your paper now during the lecture if you feel you want to ask any question just write in the chat and i will then answer that question so the paper pattern says that we have section 1 a that is worth 30 marks very important one and here you have to face 15 otqs so from from which syllabus area you can expect this 30 marks 15 otqs so that means the entire syllabus area examiner can ask anything from anywhere examiner might ask something from the very easy or the very like unimportant accounting standards such as is 10 is 2 is 8 they might ask about the isb framework or performance measurement non financial elements but as far as section b is concerned we have 30 marks again and there we have uh, like three mtqs means 15 otqs right and here here you have to face three question worth 10 mark each and here examiner can give you uh, like one question on ifrs 15 examiner might give you a question on is 10 and is 37 you might get a question on is 16 and is 12 you might get a question on ifrs like 16 So anything can be possible here. So if if you have a good understanding of a single accounting standard, and if examiner asks you in that section B question, then that would be a like a good thing for you. Now, as far as the section C, which is the tough one, and here you to here you have to use the Excel and Word document. Your Excel skills are important; should be important. Here we have one question, usually. from which section that is ratio and interpretation it's type it's, it's a kind of uh, the question which uh, examiner usually ask that means you will find it in in every exam examiner will ask about the ratios and interpretation the second thing is the groups financial statement now sometimes there there, there will be a separate question on groups financial statement sometime examiner merge these two topics and there is a question on single company financial statement so you might get a 20 mark question here you might get a 20 mark question a combination of both so that means you have to focus on all these three topics these three topics must be good enough in order to score the maximum marks from section c now let's begin with our today's agenda in today's discussion we'll discuss the ias and ifrs and then i will connect these with the final final account that is the single company financial statement because we have to apply these accounting standards onto the single company financial statement and we have to prepare the income statement balance sheet and change in the equity now so begin with let's begin with one of the important accounting standard and that is called the is 12 which is taxation most many student find it very difficult but uh, believe me is 12 as far as the fr paper is concerned it's very easy so let's focus on what we have to cover in this accounting standard as per our syllabus so we have two areas to focus on one is the treatment of current tax and another is the treatment of the deferred taxation now let me show you one of the past paper uh, of uh, the single company financial statement question so that you will get an idea that uh, how examiner 
ask an adjustment related with tax. So let's see this question. This is a final account question. We have been provided a trial balance. Then we have certain adjustments related with uh, the IES or IFRS. So you can see here, then uh, in the adjustment number six, it has been written there, the tax figure in the trial balance represents the under or over provision from the previous year. The current tax liability for the year is estimated to be 3.2 million. And in point number three, they are saying that there is a deferred tax applicable at this gain is 25%. So in a final account question, it's like very likely that you have to face with the adjustment of tax. So you should be familiar of IS 12 adjustment specifically with respect to single company financial statement. Now in current tax, what we have to do, we have to record the tax expense of the current year. And for that, you will be given the tax estimate for the year. Suppose tax estimate for the year is 10 million. And assuming that there is no under or over provision from the last year. So what I, what I will do then, I have to book a journal entry that is tax expense debit. I have to show this in profit and loss account and I have to book a liability that is the current tax payable credit. So one effect I have to transfer in profit and loss account and another effect I have to transfer in statement of financial position as a current liability. Now sometime it happens that you will be given the estimate for the year, suppose the estimate for the year is 10 million and in the trial balance, you will be, you have a balance of like say suppose 2 million on credit side. And they are saying that this is due to under or over provision. Yes, you will get these notings. What I'm writing right now, uh, this and the recorded lectures will be shared to you at the end of the session. So no need to write. You can take notes as per your understanding. If you want to, uh, from my lecture, if you want to uh, note something down, you can note in your words and uh, simultaneously you can do some calculation. You must have your calculator and uh, the paper and pen and you can do some calculation as well because it's very difficult to just listen the lecture. If you work along with me, that would be very helpful. So sometimes the estimate and the trial balance figure has been given against the current tax. And they say is that this represents the under or over provision of tax. So first of all, how you can identify that balance is under provision or over provision. So what has happened in the last year, the estimate was different and the actual payment was different. And as a result, it might be an under provision of tax or an over provision of tax. So if trial balance is having a credit balance with respect to that, that is called the over provision of tax. And similarly, if trial balance is reflecting a balance that is on debit side, so what I do, I will consider this as under provision of tax. So as soon as I get the trial balance, yes, the over provision is always on the credit side of the trial balance. So as soon as I get a trial balance in the final account question, I have to see, is there any tax balance available? Like see in the question, you can see here, this is the question. This is a trial balance. Now see. In the trial balance, is there any tax value? So you can see there is a tax note number six and the tax value is on the debit side. So it means what? It means this is the under provision of tax. Now note six is saying that the tax figure in the trial balance represents the under or over provision. They're not telling you that what is that? 
So you have to assess. Now they are saying that this is under or over. I checked it's on debit side. So it's under provision. Now see adjustment number six again. The tax estimate for the year is 3.2 million. Now it's very simple now. So what you have to do, you have to consider the tax estimate for this year. This will be given for the current year. And you have to add under provision of tax. If there is an under provision of tax, the treatment is that I will add this in order to make this a tax expense. This is my tax expense that will be part of profit and loss account. This value to be shown in profit and loss account. But this under provision has nothing to do with the balance sheet value. So my balance sheet liability, my SFP liability would be the estimate for the year, not the adjusted amount. So this adjusted amount is for the profit and loss account. Got it? And similarly, if you get a figure of tax estimate and there is a credit balance in the trial balance, so what you will do, you will deduct the over provision of tax from this estimate in order to get the value that is expense for the year. Again, this is the value to be shown in profit and loss account. And this is the value that would be shown as a current liability. So it's very simple. And these are the easiest marks available in the single company financial statement calculation. So this is one of the aspect of the IS-12, which is the current tax, which is an expense, which is a liability. Now let's focus on deferred tax and see how we can understand the deferred tax and its adjustment in the single company financial statement. Why we recognize deferred tax? Is recognition of deferred tax is per ISP framework. Anything you want to recognize either as an asset, liability, income or expense, remember that the framework justification is necessary. So under framework, we have some definitions and these definition you must learn by heart. That is what is an asset? What is, an, what is a liability? What is income? And what is expense? You don't need your own definition. Learn by heart the exact words that what is asset, what is liability, income and expense. And sometimes you have to justify why something is a liability. So how you will justify if you don't know the definition? So as far as the deferred tax is concerned, there might be two outcomes of deferred tax. Either it would be a deferred tax liability and it might be a deferred tax asset depending on the situation. Now deferred tax is recognized in the financial statement because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thing which relates to future, but incurred now and that would affect the future results. So that means the definition of liability as well as the definition of asset. Now, why we, when we recognize deferred tax liability or deferred tax asset. So deferred tax arises due to temporary differences. Now, why, why there is a difference between the accounting rules and tax rules? Why not both are same? As we know that the accounting rules are different and the tax rules are different. So as a result, we have some differences between the treatment. And these differences might be classified into two types. One is the difference that is called the permanent difference and other is called the temporary difference. For permanent difference, there would be no deferred tax consequences. Okay. 
because deferred tax is simply a phenomena under the temporary difference concept. It means I have an expense, but as per tax authority, that expense is different. Say, suppose the accounting depreciation, 100 million, and the tax depreciation, which is capital allowance, is 120 million. Now, this is a kind of temporary difference because the total depreciation will remain the same, but the yearly depreciation is different and that creates a difference into what I want to book and what is the actual tax liability. So that's creating a problem that either I have paid tax now more or I have to pay tax in future. So the effect of temporary differences is that either I have to pay tax in future or I have to get some relief in future. So the simple story is that deferred tax has been recognized due to the temporary differences, not due to the permanent differences. Now, move on. Now, as a result of these temporary differences, these temporary differences, whatever is the reason, can be classified into two types. One is called the taxable temporary difference. Taxable temporary difference. And other is called the deductible temporary difference. You have to establish how you can identify whether this is a taxable temporary difference or the deductible temporary difference, I'll tell you. But first of all, whenever there is a taxable temporary difference, it will result in deferred tax liability, always. And if there is a deductible temporary difference, it will result in deferred tax asset value. So, the taxable temporary difference, which is TTD, results in deferred tax liability, and the deductible temporary difference, which is DTD, always results in deferred tax asset. Now, once you have identified the differences, you have to classify the difference into either as permanent difference or the temporary difference. Ignore that permanent difference for deferred tax purpose. Consider only temporary differences. Now you have to classify your temporary difference as taxable or deductible. Now, how you'll classify that a difference is taxable, temporary or deductible temporary difference. For that, we'll use the balance sheet approach. And the balance sheet approach says that you have to compare the carrying amount of asset or liability, you have to compare carrying amount of asset or liability, which is the balance sheet value with the tax base of similar asset and liability. You have to compare these two figures. What is tax base? Can anyone tell me? Any idea about what is tax base? I hope you must be familiar about the tax base value. For example, yes, the value of asset and liability as per tax authority. This is value of asset or liability as per tax rules. So obviously accounting rules are different and tax rules are different. For example, you might have the carrying amount of a property plan and equipment in your balance sheet that is 200. But when you identify the relevant tax base of that property plan and equipment is 180 million. Now this is a difference. And this is a temporary difference. So as a result, you have identified that this is a temporary difference. And if this is a temporary difference, so it might be a taxable one or it might be a deductible one. 
So what we have to do? We will compare the assets and liabilities line by line for each assets, identify its carrying amount and then identify its tax base, identify the difference, classify that difference as temporary, taxable temporary or the deductible temporary. Now you must follow this rule for assets if carrying amount is greater than tax base this results in what taxable temporary difference if carrying amount is less than tax base this results in deductible temporary difference like in my previous example, you can see that carrying amount is greater than tax base. So the temporary difference is taxable temporary difference. And for liabilities, if carrying amount is greater than tax base, it's reverse tax deductible temporary difference. And if carrying amount is less than tax base, this is taxable temporary difference. And after identification of this for TTD multiply by the tax rate, you will get a figure of deferred tax liability. And for DTD, if there is net DTT, then multiply by tax rate, you will get a figure of deferred tax asset. Sometimes it might be a deferred tax liability and sometimes it might be a deferred tax asset. In order to pass the journal entry and to transfer the effect into the financial statement, we will compare its opening position. For example, I have opening deferred tax liability of 10 million. I have identified closing deferred tax liability and that becomes 12 million. So I have to pass the adjustment that is the increase in deferred tax liability by 2 million this is situation number one or it might be a situation that at the beginning in the trial balance i have deferred tax liability of 12 million but when i calculate it at the year end there is a deferred tax liability of only 10 million it means that there is a decrease in deferred tax liability of 2 million now for increase in deferred tax liability, we have to book it as an expense. This will be charged in balance sheet as a liability, the ending balance and the difference. If it's an increase, you will recognize deferred tax expense. And then similar situation, the cl closing balance is a balance sheet value and the difference if it is decreased treated as income or reduce your tax expense. And sometimes it happens that we have a deferred tax asset. So you will deal the asset accordingly. Increase in asset is an income and decrease in deferred tax asset is an expense. Is that clear? Any question up till now? This is an overview of IAS 12, the overview. I have to add one more thing in that. That is the revaluation surplus treatment. And then I will focus on two, one or two MCQs. And then you will start next topic. The agenda is to discuss few topics and then connect this topic to the final, final account question, the single company financial statement question. Now, sometimes if you, if you want to put a journal entry for that increase in deferred tax, so we'll book this as deferred tax expense debit. This is increase in deferred tax liability and you have to credit the deferred tax liability in the statement of financial position.
Now, most of the time we recognize defer tax expense in profit and loss account as an expense. But sometimes the impact of deferred tax cannot be recognized in profit and loss account. Do you know why? What is the situation when you cannot recognize a deferred tax impact in profit and loss account? There is a connection between IS 16 and IS 12 that in case of the revaluation surplus, you are trying to revalue your property plan and equipment is revaluation compulsory or optional thing for the business revaluation is being covered under is 36 is 16 sorry is 16 and is 38 the tangible asset as well as intangible asset first time revaluation is optional because under is 16 there are two options available either you can use the cost model or you can opt for the revaluation model but once you have opted for revaluation model so for consistency reason you have to continuously follow the revaluation model and there is a question now is it possible that after op option opting for revaluation model can you transfer from revaluation model to cost model is it allowed under IA 16? What's your thought on that? Is it allowed? From cost model to revaluation model, that is quite justifiable because you are transferring to a, uh, the, the up to date value but from the revaluation to cost model, this is permitted, but this is not a sensible things to do. Okay. So you will not find it usual that a company is going down from revaluation surplus to cost cost model, but it's permitted. Now, as a result of revaluation, what it happened that, for example, I have a land. And it is having a broad forward value of 10,000. And its market value now 12,000. And I have decided to revalue it by 2,000. So where to record this revaluation surplus? You should know that it is an other comprehensive income item. You cannot recognize this into profit and loss account. Rather, we will transfer this into OCI. Now, as a result of this, will there be any deferred tax consequences? Now, the carrying amount is different and the tax base, what would be the tax base? The tax authority will not accept the revaluation. So they will say that the tax base is only 10,000. Now, as a result, there is a difference. The carrying amount is 12,000 due to revaluation and the tax base is only 10,000 and the asset value is greater than its tax base. So it means it's a taxable temporary difference that is 2000 and assuming a tax rate of 30%, what is my defer tax liability? I have a defer tax liability of 600. Assuming the opening balance is zero. So I have to recognize deferred tax liability of 600. Now, if I want to put this as deferred tax expense debit and deferred tax liability credit, that is, that is the wrong treatment. Why? Because this deferred tax re relates with the revaluation surplus. And as revaluation surplus is an OCI item, so the tax will follow that treatment and tax will be recognized in OCI as well. So I will credit deferred tax liability as always, but I will debit the revaluation surplus. Instead of the profit and loss account, I have to debit it in OCI. And as a result, my revaluation surplus is net of deferred tax is 2000 
minus the deferred tax impact, its net of deferred tax is 1400 in OCI. Now, sometimes in the exam, examiner will give you the net figure and you have to identify, you have to find out the gross sub figure. For example, if 1400 has been given as the revaluation surplus net of tax, you, you will be required to do it. You have to gross it up. As a, result, as a result, you have to use the tax percentage in order to gross it up. Is that clear? Okay. Now let's apply this into the final account question. So this is one of the past paper question from March, June, 2019. And you can see that there is an extract available and we have many figures, the adjustment, uh, if you can see the adjustment. First one is related with IFRS 15. Second is related with IS 21 foreign currency. The third one is the well-known financial instrument adjustment. The fourth one is related with IS 16 and deferred tax. The fifth one is IS 40. The sixth one is deferred tax. And the seventh one is the issue related with the shares. So let's focus on the tax related adjustment first. The fourth one. During the year, the company revalued its head office for the first time resulting in an increase in value of 12 million at 31st December 2008. That means it's a revaluation surplus. Deferred tax is applicable to this gain at 25%. Now see, is there any opening balance of deferred tax liability? We have cost of sales, we have, we have tax note number six, we have no tax related effect that is if that has been given, it will be written as text note number four. So we have no deferred tax brought forward. So it means that we have to recognize this deferred tax liability. Okay. And there is also one adjustment. The tax figure in the trial balance is under or over provision. I told you that is under provision. The current tax estimate for the year is 3.2 million. Now in this question, there are two tax related adjustment. If you do it correctly, you will get at least two to three marks from that. Let's focus on this. So, can you see these adjustments in front of you? So, first of all, let's find out the deferred tax impact. So we have a revaluation surplus in four. We have revaluation surplus in four. So we have revaluation surplus that is 12 million. The gain, it means what? It means carrying amount is greater than tax base. It's understood that there is a taxable temporary difference. This 12 million is the taxable temporary difference and multiply this 12 million with the tax rate will give you a figure of 3 million. So we have 3 million deferred tax liability. How to recognize it? Revaluation surplus debit by 3 million and deferred tax liability credit by 3 million. So in the balance sheet, in the OCI, what you will show, you will show revaluation surplus at original 12 million minus the deferred tax impact 3 million and you will recognize 9 million in OCI. And so as in the statement of changes in equity and the equity side. And as far as the other side of the concern, I already told you that this is the tax estimate 
3.2 million. So we have tax estimate 3.2 million and we have to add the under or over provision here it's under provision of tax given in the trial balance what is the trial balance figure the trial balance figure is 1,30,000 1,30,000 means in million i guess it's 1.3 am i right so It's 0.13. So it's 3.33 million that is to be shown as tax expense in profit and loss account. And what would be the balance sheet figure? How much is to be shown in balance sheet? The current liability, current tax liability is going to be 3.2 million and the deferred tax liability is going to be hmm, how much three million so these are i'm preparing the extract and the focus on is to apply the accounting standard into a given situation so when i solve one or more final account question so you will be familiar that how easy is the adjustment once you know the topic now this is an overview and I have applied this into the final account question as well. Subsequently, we'll also discuss. Sometimes in the exam question, the teachers, the, the tutor says, the examiner says that you will be given in the question that there is an increase in taxable temporary difference. Rather than giving you a closing balance, they give you that there is an increase in taxable temporary difference by 10 million. What is this? How to deal with this? Because we have, an, we have an habit of dealing with the opening and closing balance. We took the difference and then we'll, we'll pass the journal entry, post the transaction. But instead of giving this, examiner give you a difference. That is increase in taxable temporary difference, temp temporary difference by 10 million. So don't worry about it. Just take this difference, multiply by the tax rate and increase in temporary difference taxable. It's a deferred tax liability. It's increase in deferred tax liability. So we have 3 million increase in deferred tax liability and either tax expenses to be debited or the revaluation surplus, depending on what was the reason of this taxable temporary difference? Okay, now focus on another accounting standard, a very important one that is uh, what you are talking about this existing example, like what is the tax estimate in the tax expense? And you're saying that uh, tax expense is 6.33. Why? Why 6.33? The effect of income tax is 3.2 plus the under provision that is 3.33. And the deferred tax effect will not charge in profit and loss account. Deferred tax effect would be recognized in revaluation surplus that is 12 million revaluation surplus minus 3 million deferred tax effect to so 9 million not in profit and loss account so profit and loss account tax figure would be 3.33 million not 6.33 million now let's talk about financial instrument I'm teaching this subject for the last 16 years. So I know that what maximum an examiner can ask you in a particular accounting standard, whether it's an MTQ or OTQ, or it might be an MCQ. What 
what do you want me to explain the revaluation surplus treatment or this one which i discussed that normally it it you examiner give you like that instead to give you a ending temporary difference the examiner will give you a difference of taxable temporary difference either increase in taxable temporary difference or decrease in taxable temporary difference i give you an example of the exam question paper then in exam you might have to face this okay okay let's move ahead the revaluation topic and the deferred tax tax topic is not an easy one mind you you have to work very hard on the revaluation stuff examiner might create problem for you in revaluation so we have two standards to discuss these financial instrument issues one is ias 32 and other is ifrs 9 there is a disclosure based accounting standard as well which is ifrs 7 but that is disclosure based accounting standard nothing to do with the calculation of financial instrument now in this particular topic let me give you a brief overview that we have to deal with a financial instrument comprises of financial asset for one entity one entity holds the financial asset the other entity holds the financial liability or sometimes the equity instrument or sometimes both am i right is this the correct definition of financial instrument one party is having a financial asset and other party is having a financial liability or equity instrument or both sometimes both so this standards cover the accounting treatment of financial asset the accounting treatment of financial liabilities along with the equity instruments now as far as the financial asset is concerned it means that uh, you have purchased a financial instrument of an entity that has been issued by an entity so it might be investment in shares that you have investment in shares or it might be investment in loan stock in debts so under investment you have to face with these two issues how to deal with investment in shares and how to deal with investment in loan stocks any idea about investment in shares how you classify your investment in shares before there is a classification of financial asset there is a measurement of financial asset there is a recognition of financial asset or financial liability it's a huge accounting standard but not that difficult one in your syllabus there are a few technical articles you you must have an habit of uh, studying these technical articles on acca website so do refer to these articles if you if you have time available and uh, there are technical articles with respect to financial instrument so if you find time try to study that that as well it will it will give you some information some calculations some examples now see this is one of the technical article on acca website that deals with financial instrument and it's very easy that financial assets there are two types of financial assets one is the investment in equity investment other is the equity debt instruments and there are further classifications okay there are further classifications
so you can check this article for a good understanding of this topic let me give you a brief understanding of that if you have invested in ordinary shares of a company if you have purchased shares of the company then there might be two classification one is fptpl that is true profit and loss and other is fpt oci that is true other comprehensive income how will identify that investment is uh, in fptpl category your investment must be held for trading if you have purchased this instrument for held for trading purpose then it would be recognized as a fptpl instrument and if not if it's not for trading then it's an oci category so what is the main difference is two the difference is between two is one of the difference is about transaction cost the treatment of transaction cost is different in these two there is no restriction on the sale of asset you can sell at any time but intention is not there if intention is there that you are uh, waiting for a good price so it's held for trading and number 2 it's about how to treat their gain or loss these two you have to consider now as far as transaction cost is concerned if you have, if you have purchased an instrument and it is classified as fvtpl then transaction cost would be part in profit and loss account you cannot capitalize the transaction cost but if it is fvt oci then it is to be capitalized with investment and you will add the transaction cost with your investment figure now as far as the gain or loss is concerned the treatment of gain or loss also different if it is a category of fvtpl if it is fvt oci then in case of tpl then gain and loss is to be recognized in profit and loss account and here the gain or loss both is to be recognized in the other comprehensive income so you have to just identify what is the instrument and the correct accounting treatment of that instrument not that difficult now as far as the investment in debt instrument is concerned there might be three possible criteria it might be fvtpl it might be fvt oci or it might be on the basis of amortized cost in your syllabus the most likely one is the amortized cost and in order to classify the debt instrument you have to follow two test and for amortized cost the two test one is the business model test that must be satisfied and other is the contractual cash flow characteristic test so any idea about what is business model test in order to classify your debt instrument as amortized cost category the intention is to hold your instrument till maturity and to get the interest payment and the repayment of principal 
nothing else and the cash flows would be solely interest in principal nothing else so first is the intention and the second one is the type of cash flow you are receiving from this instrument on the basis of that you can classify that one instrument is either fpt oci or fpt pl but in case of fe oci you mu you must you can either hold that instrument or you can sell that instrument as well but for fet pl the condition is that if the instrument is for held for trading then it will be classified as fet pl but in in the fr exam you will you have to face this business model test the same amortized cost category usually now once you have identified once you have classified that an investment is in the amortized cost category what is the initial measurement treatment how you have to measure this instrument initially so you have to find out the price paid what you have paid for example you paid 1 million against this and you have to add the transaction cost because transaction cost is to be capitalized as well so as a result we have the investment and you will put that investment in sfp and then subsequently at each reporting date you don't have to find out the fair value rather you have to find out you have to recognize that as at the amortized cost and what is amortized cost you have to add interest income in that that is the initial value add your finance income and if you have received any kind of interest during the accounting period then you have to deduct your interest amount received and as a result this is your closing balance or the sfp value and this finance income is to be recognized in profit and loss account as an income and this is a part which will transfer in cash flow statement but the focus of examiner is on the liability side rather than on the asset side if you can see the past papers so let's move to the liability side that is the financial liabilities and equity instruments one is the simple financial liability and uh, if there is any financial liability there are two categories one is the fptpl again and one is the amortized cost category in our syllabus we use this amortized cost category this is not considered to be part of our syllabus so in the case of financial liability you will always face the amortized cost category so once you have issued a debt instrument it means you are receiving the proceed of that instrument so its initial measurement would be how much you have received that is the fair value so amount raised how much you have raised from this for example 500000 now if there is any the subsequent measurement of the financial instrument of the financial asset which is be classified as amortized cost so you have to find out the amortized cost and that is the opening value plus the finance income and deduct if you have received any interest amount remember that that finance income the rate would be the effective rate 
can calculate the finance income using the effective rate and the interest received is based on the coupon amount. There might be two rate and normally the effective rate is greater than the coupon one. Why effective rate is greater than coupon normally? Any idea? No, I'm asking why it is different. Why the instrument's effective rate is different from the coupon rate. I'm not asking what is effective rate. The reason is that when you purchased any instrument, the return that you are receiving from that instrument is the annual return, which is the coupon rate. For example, suppose, suppose let's assume the coupon is 5% and your effective is 6%. So why there is one person extra? This, this is due to the capital gain element because there is a capital gain in it. So that's why it's effective rate is more than that. And the effect of and the difference is due to the transaction cost, the difference between the initial value and the redemption value. These two affect this difference. You are right to some extent. Okay, let's leave that. So the initial measurement is the amount raised. And if there is any transaction cost paid, so this transaction cost paid is to be deducted from this amount raised. So what exactly the amount raised? The net amount raised is 9,495,000. So as a result, I have to deduct transaction cost because it's a payment. The amount raised is an inflow and transaction cost paid is an outflow. Now, what would be my journal entry if needed? Bank account debit, 4,95,000. And my financial liability is to be credited in balance sheet, that is 4,95,000. And then each reporting date, I have to use the subsequent measurement criteria for that financial liability. And this is the same as what I did with the asset at amortized cost. And this is the reverse of the amortized cost of the financial asset. You will take the initial value net of transaction cost, you have to pay interest. So you will add the finance cost using the effective rate. And then if you have paid any actual interest using the coupon rate, so interest cost paid, you will deduct that interest cost. And as a result, this is the SFP value that is the closing value of your financial liability. And that would be part of PL, that would be part of financial position. And it is what rate I have applied on this? I have applied the effective rate. So, in this way, the working says that it is not that different. It is to some extent similar, but this is an reverse position. Any question up till now? In the single company financial statement examiner sometimes create some different things. 
So let's discuss one of the MCQ. I usually ask one question in between. Are you getting something from this session? I have just completed yesterday my five day FR revision and uh, the feedback is quite awesome. And the recordings are available too for the December exam only for the December exam students, those who are preparing for December exam. I have the FR uh, recorded lectures of the uh, revision session that I took a few session back for in Urdu as well. So you can get that as well. At the end of this session, I will upload this in my Google Drive and then I will share the link with that so you can access it afterwards till the date of your exam. Now see one of the MCQ we might get. Wander issued $10 million 5% loan notes on 1st January 2009. What is this 5%? This is the coupon rate. Issue cost is 400,000. The loan notes are redeemable at a premium. Now, as it is on premium and there is a issue cost, so obviously the, there would be an effect of uh, the uh, incremental effect and that creates a difference between the coupon rate and effective rate, giving them an effective rate of 8%. So an effective rate includes three components. One is the impact of transaction cost, the effect of premium or discount, and the coupon rate. Coupon rate is included in the effective rate. So why effective rate is different and why effective rate is greater than that? Sometimes effective rate and the coupon rate is same. And it is very least likely that the effective rate is less than the coupon rate. It's very least likely. But you can't say that it's impossible. It is possible, but not, not likely. So here we have an effective rate of 8%. What is the requirement? What expense should be recorded in the loan notes for the year ended December 2009? So he's asking about the first year accounting treatment. So first of all, let me find out the initial value. What is the initial value? The initial value is we have raised how much money? We have raised $10 million. But in order to get this $10 million, I have to issue, I have to issue the issue cost. So I have to deduct issue costs, which is 0.4 million. And my net proceed is 9.6 million. So my initial liability is 9.6 million. But subsequently, I have to adjust it to amortized cost. So subsequent, you have to report it to amortization cost or amortized cost. So amortized cost is the initial value. 9.6 million add finance cost using the effective rate, which is the 8% value. So 9.6 million into 8%. How much is that? Can you tell me in million? 0 0.768, right? Sometimes interest paid is zero. Is it is it possible to have an interest paid of zero? Yes, there might be a zero coupon bond. So in that case, we have, remember that the coupon is always applicable on par value. Don't confuse with that. So what is the 
balance sheet value. So it's 9.6 million. Plus 0 0.768 minus 0 0.5. It's 9.868. Okay, let me check. 10 million into 0 0.05. It's 0 0.5. So my original answer was right. 9.868. How much is to be charged in profit and loss account? The requirement was identify the amount to be charged in profit and loss account. So my answer is 0 0.768 million. And you have to write in thousand. So you have to convert this into thousand and you will write 76800. Okay, now let's focus on the other aspect. Sometimes examiner will give you the issuance of convertible debt. And in the single company financial statement, you might get this convertible debt issue. So what is convertible debt? Do you have any idea about convertible debt? The problem with convertible debt, it means you pay interest on regular basis and on redemption or early redemption, there is a choice. Either investor can get cash or investor will get the shares of the company. Who will decide? The company or the investor? The investor has to decide whether investor wants to opt for the cash value or the shares value. Now directors are saying that we assume that the company is very good and it's most likely, it is like virtually certain that our shares will be converted or that will be converted into ordinary shares. And they are saying that the issuance of convertible debt is to be treated as a simple debt Will you give you any? Will you give you any any counter argument for that? It has been asked in any past paper question. The directors are saying that that to record it as a simple liability, no equity instrument. The reason is that it is most likely that the conversion will not take place. So I have to ask the accounting standard that what is the treatment and the accounting standard, which is IS thirty two, says that. Whenever you issue a convertible debt, how likely or not likely is that we have to perform the split accounting? What it means? It means the, const the instrument is a hybrid one. It has two element. It is, has a liability component as well as an equity component. It's not a single component. Whenever you issue a convertible debt, remember it's an hybrid instrument from the issuer point of view. Remember from the issuer point of view, it's an hybrid instrument. So you have to consider that. And what you will do, you will identify, for example, the value of convertible debt is suppose you raise 10 million. What do you have to do? Identify first liability component. And what is the criteria? How will identify its liability component? Find out present value of future cash flows without conversion option. 
present value of future cash flows but without conversion option let's suppose it's uh, 9.2 million then the residual is equity component an equity component is always the residual one so 10 million minus 9.2 million 0.8 million is equity option and you will transfer this equity option into the equity side of the balance sheet not in oci remember this is not an oci item it will be recognized in a statement of changes in equity in the balance sheet side and for this 9.2 what you will do you have to subsequently account for this at amortized cost each year a similar principle that is the using the effective rate and the coupon rate you have to determine the closing value till the decision taken by the investor now what to do with this equity option will we change anything on that till the decision taken by the investor it will remain as uh, it will remain as equity option and there will be no subsequent accounting okay so important thing is for any student is to find out this liability component and then the subsequent accounting and then there might be some mistake given to you in the question and it might be possible that you have to correct that mistake okay let's try one mcq on that then i will go to the final account question IS 16 PPE depreciation and revaluation IS 12 taxation issue IFRS 9 financial instrument IS 16 leases IFRS 15 construction contract the most important five adjustments and if you want to score good in the single company financial statement you must know these five standards carefully or very very uh, effectively otherwise you might might struggle in final account question remember that you have to struggle in interpretation answer because i believe people have no way how to write the interpretation of financial statement because they do not practice it like they have to do first of all they must know what the definition of ratio is why the ratio has been changed what are what might be the reason they have to connect that to the scenario and then they have to prepare a report and for that you need to work hard i will give you some guidelines how to do that effectively but you have to work side by side on the consolidation as well as the final account element of the question there are many students who just uh, study from my youtube channel there are almost 50 plus video lectures on fr but majority are on in urdu or hindi version and they used to study from there and they get the 50 plus marks they don't need the teacher and but there are many students who are taking the regular classes and they are not able to pass so it's all it's all about the approach the exam approach now let's see is there anyone who is following me on my youtube channel who used to watch my lectures oh that's good okay let's see one minute
so we have on 1st october 2003 we issued 10 million convertible loan notes which carry a coupon rate of 5% per annum why coupon rate is lower than why coupon rate of convertible is lower than simple debt can you answer this question the convertible debt is normally much cheaper than the normal debt so in this example we have a coupon rate of 5% the loan notes are redeemable on 30th september 2006 after 3 years i guess after 3 years at cash or can be exchanged with equity a similar loan note without the conversion option would have required b to pay an interest rate of 8% always take this interest as the effective rate and you have to use this as a discount rate for the pv calculation the present value factor at the rate of 5% and the rate of 8% in given why 5% and 8% just to confuse you we just need this the coupon sorry effective rate or the discount rate this 5% is irrelevant how much would be recorded in equity in relation to the loan notes so we need to find out the initial value of equity so we need to split accounting we have to find out the liability component first so we have to perform the split accounting so first of all the 1st october is the issuance date the redemption date is 30th september 6 so it's 4 5 6 there are three years you can do it by making a table that is year cash flows discount factor and pv so there are three interest payments either you can use the nut factor or the present value factor so what is the interest what is the interest value 10 million into 5% so interest is 10 million into 5% how much is it this is periodic interest make it 1000 calculate in 1000 so it's 0.05 it's 500 take 500 per annum interest for 3 years and then at the end of 3 years assume that it will be redeemed at the par value and the par value is 10000 put 8% discount factor here and it's 0.93 0.86 0.79 and 0.79 can you find out the present values this is 465 the next one 430 which topic you want me to focus more on in this revision session Seven thousand nine hundred. If you plus all these items, this is the liability component. Nine one nine zero. This is the liability component. So, what is the equity component? The equity component is the residual value that is ten thousand minus the liability component, and the resulting. difference is the equity which is 810 put 810 here and get two marks yes ratios and interpretation is tough one but inshallah we will we'll discuss so that we have a good understanding of ratios as well
Now see another MCQ with respect to IFRS 9. DEF purchased 15,000 shares on 1st August 2006 at a cost of 6.50 each. Transaction cost is 1,500. At the year end, 30th September 2006, these shares are worth 7.75. Select the correct gain and place it will be recorded. So why, what, why they have purchased this? No ID. If nothing has been mentioned, then what to do? Let's identify the gain. What is the initial value? 15,000 multiply by 6.50. The initial value without transaction cost. That is 97,500. What is the subsequent value? 7.75. How much is the value? One one six two five zero. Can you find out the difference? This is the one eight seven five zero. Also check the other way around that uh, the initial value including transaction cost, it's uh, considered to be 97,500 plus 1,500. What is the value? If it is considered as an OCI item, 99,000. And the ending value is 116250. And what is the gain that? One seven two five zero. As far as the gain is concerned, both amount are given. Now, where to record this? What is the treatment? Where to record this? In OCI or in profit and loss account? Wait one minute. So the correct answer is the gain is 17250. Am I right? The gain is 18750. And recognize it in profit and loss account. Now see the final account adjustment in the same question in which I did the IS-12.
because this is treated as the fair value through profit and loss account adjustment, not the OCI one. The question is technically not correct because uh, there must be an indicator, there must be an uh, idea that what is that. So let me recheck the question whether I have. Uh, as there is nothing mentioned in the question, so we'll assume that it's a FETPL transaction. Nothing has been there. so take it FATPL. Now see, in the adjustment number four, check the adjustment number four. And before do that, check the trial balance. In the trial balance, we have uh, finance cost 4050. So with respect to adjustment number Three, we acquired nine million five percent bond at par value on first January two thousand and eight. Is this financial asset or financial liability? It's financial asset, true. The interest is receivable on 31st December each year. The company incurred 0.4 million broker fee when acquiring the bonds, which has been charged to operating expense. These bonds are redeemable, so I have an effective rate of 8%. V has recorded the interest received as investment income. So in the above, he has recorded the investment income. Let me copy is this and let me solve how we can correct this error. Okay, so this is the question. Let's find out the mistake. The mistake is that they have charged this in profit and loss account. And they have recognized the investment income. That is the interest received. How much is the interest received? Can you calculate? 9 million multiplied by 5%. How much is the value? It's 450. So this 450 is uh, part of this investment income. Am I right? And we have something, some a wrong value in this operating expense as well. So first of all, we have to reverse the effect of this. So we have to calculate the initial value. So investment, they put 9 million investment. And then transaction cost is 0.4 million. So initial value is 9.4 million. This is the initial measurement. And then on this initial measurement, I have to apply the finance income that would be recognized as investment income. And what is that? 9.4 million into the effective rate. What is my finance income? The investment income. It's 752. It means that I have to adjust the broker fee 
I have to adjust the broker fee that has been charged in profit and loss account as an expense. So I have to pass an adjustment that um, Can you identify the journal entry of that 0.4 million? Wrong treatment. Asset debit, 0.4 million. And expense, which has been credited by mistake, is credited. So one of the adjustment is, it means, Operating expenses, you have to put adjustment here in operating expenses. Now, what about the finance income? What adjustment you have to pass in finance income? We have recognized uh, the coupon, which is 450, but we have to put this 9752 in investment income. How much is the difference? It's 302. So it means I have to increase my finance income. So finance income debit by 302 and asset credit by 302 or 0 0.302. It means that if you have to prepare balance sheet, the requirement, we have to prepare the, I have to prepare the profit and loss account, not the balance sheet. So the financial asset value is not needed. But what I have to do is to make adjustment in profit and loss account regarding the operating expense. I have to deduct 0.4 million from operating expense and I have to add 302 into my investment income. So one adjustment is in investment income, you have to increase, and other is operating expense, which you have to reduce that. So these type of question usually being asked in the final account question, you might be given a mistake and you have to adjust that mistake as well. So this is what the major portion of the financial instrument. Now let's focus on the third one, the third accounting standard, and that is IAS 16, property, land, and equipment. I will, I will discuss these three together. One is the intangibles because there are similarities as well. And IAS 36, impairment loss. You can also connect IS 40, which is the investment property, which is also not difficult, not difficult or not different from IS 16 to some extent. Now, one thing that you have to be very careful about is the treatment of initial measurement. You might be given some data and you have to identify the initial measurement cost. We know that if you buy any property plan and equipment, or if you develop any property plan and equipment, it is to be initially measured at cost. So what constitutes the item of cost? What do you have to add in it? Purchase price, net of trade discount, taxes, which are non-refundable, correct me if I'm wrong, the import duty, transportation cost, the electrician fee, the engineering fee, etc., etc., in order to bring that asset into workable condition, plus the dismantling cost in present value terms dismantling and site restoration cost. 
can we add borrowing cost in it can we add interest cost in it so examiner might give you something about is 23 the borrowing cost sometimes you have to capitalize borrowing cost yes sometimes you have to add the borrowing cost as well if borrowing cost is to be capitalized then otherwise not so do read is 23 that sometimes borrowing cost is to be charged in profit and loss account as an expense and sometimes it is to be included in the value of the asset okay so this is the initial value and uh, the ppe is subsequently to be measured at either the cost model or the revaluation model the most important favorite for examiner is revaluation and in the final account question you will have to face this uh, revaluation model most of the time most of the time will get an adjustment of this revaluation model if you perform revaluation exercise there might be an increase in the value of asset or it might be that there is some decrease in the value of the asset increase or decrease where to recognize if there is an increase it will be recognized in oci but in case of a decrease you have to recognize in profit and loss account as a revaluation deficit now the treatment of depreciation that before revaluation your depreciation is different after revaluation your depreciation is different now what to do and what about revaluation surplus that is part of the uh, like uh, the oci the unrealized gain so what to do with that can we recognize this in profit and loss account now let's see one question one final account question in which you will find some adjustment of property and revaluation a good one so i will use that question for this uh, revaluation exercise on the revaluation surplus you have to be very careful because sometimes examiner will give you revaluation at the start of the year sometimes during the year and sometimes at the end of year so you have to adjust the value after revaluation and you have to also carefully check the life after revaluation because it's sometimes possible that there will be a change in the life of the asset after revaluation and you have to also see that whether there is an existing revaluation surplus available or this asset has been revalued previously or not and also consider that if there is a revaluation surplus is there any policy that says that transfer revaluation surplus in the form of excess depreciation per annum so there is a treatment that says that transfer revaluation surplus a portion of revaluation surplus from revaluation surplus to retain annum entry would be revaluation surplus debit and retain earning credit so let me connect you with an example very good one a final account question example that deals with this kind of issue so here is we have a pass paper extract so you can see here in the trial balance we have property so this is the non current asset and the property value is at 1st january 20x7 note number 4 and we have uh, revaluation surplus as well at 1st january that is the note number 
and retain earning profit figure has been given convertible loan notes so let's focus on point number 4 so point number 4 says that hefford property had previously been revalued upward so it means this is not the first time revaluation leading to the balance on the revaluation surplus at 1st january 2007 it means this surplus is the previous surplus that is the 800 and this carrying amount at 1st january is the revalued amount okay now they are saying that the property had a remaining life of 25 years on 1st january 2007 at 31st december again there is a revaluation and the property was valued at 16 million so we have to compare the carrying amount at 31st december with the market value and then we have to adjust the revaluation surplus no entries have yet been made to account for the current years depreciation charge or the property revaluation december so we need to account for the depreciation as well as revaluation the company does not make a transfer from the revaluation surplus in the form of excess depreciation okay so let me insert this information and let's have a calculation that was point number 4 and uh, we have to find out the relevant extract let's see what are the relevant extract the original question requirement is adjust the profit prepare changes in equity and balance sheet now we can see here we have uh, property value 18000 we have revaluation surplus 800 so first of all the brought forward ppe value is 18000 okay deduct one year depreciation from this so any method which is given no so it means a straight line method is to be used so 18000 divided by 25 what is the per annum depreciation it's 72 and what is the book value at 31st december the carrying amount what is the carrying amount it's 17280 so this is the carrying amount and then property was again revalued and uh, as a result we have a revaluation surplus of the market value that is 16000 now compare these two values this will give you a deficit of how much is the deficit that is 1280 now we have revaluation deficit and previously we have a revaluation surplus but that surplus is not enough to offset this whole revaluation deficit what to do now we have uh, brought forward revaluation surplus that is 800 and we have a deficit of 1280 what is 16 says so we have to reduce our revaluation surplus we have to account for depreciation as well we have to book this depreciation in profit and loss account first it's an expense number 1 number 2 that what we have to do we have to consider this change that first of all reduce uh, this revaluation surplus is 800 make it zero in oci this adjustment is in oci and then difference which is which is 480 so charge it in profit and loss account as deficit so overall deficit is 1280 
but as we have a revaluation surplus brought forward so i will adjust this 800 in oci the difference is recognized in profit and loss account i have to adjust depreciation as well what is the amount to be reported in balance sheet against this property plan and equipment what is the balance sheet value balance sheet value is this one the final value this is the sfp and revaluation surplus movement you have to show in the statement of changes in equity you can face this type of adjustment very common adjustment most of the time in exam the examiner is interested in revaluation surplus so be careful about that any question okay so let's connect another final account question with regard to revaluation surplus treatment now you can see here we have been given a trial balance extract it is not a complete trial balance so i'm interested in this adjustment note number 3 and note number 3 says that the property is carried at fair value at 30th june which is 29 million and the remaining life of the property at the beginning of the year was 15 years m does not make any annual transfer to retain earning in respect of revaluation surplus ignore deferred tax on revaluation property plan and equipment is depreciated at 15% per annum using the reducing balance method no depreciation has yet been charged for the year ended all depreciation is charged in cost of sales so this is the complete adjustment regarding ppe and we have different items of ppe here first of all we have revaluation surplus brought forward that is 3000 we have property at revaluation 28500 we have property plan and equipment we have accumulated depreciation against plant so i need to put this and i have to find out the relevant extracts so let's do that one minute so this is the final version so let's find out the relevant property and relevant plant extract first of all let's deal with the property so property is carried at fair value at year end 29 million but at the beginning of the year we have a property at valuation which is 28500 so let's assume it's a brought forward value 28500 revaluation we have to perform at the end of the year so i have to deduct one year depreciation remaining life is 15 years so 28500 divided by 15 how much is the depreciation i already told you revaluation and it is not an easy task be careful about the numbers about the life about the method of depreciation so we have a carrying amount a book value as at june 30th june 2015 and what is that that is 26600 
Now they are saying that market value is 29,000. So as a result, this is a revaluation surplus and there is further revaluation surplus. So the total revaluation surplus 2400 from this exercise and we have a broad forward revaluation surplus already which is 3000 so uh, broad forward is 3000 so the carrying amount of revaluation surplus is 5400 put this on the equity side of the balance sheet put this in oci okay so one thing is that what to do with this depreciation charge this depreciation in profit and loss account that is the cost of goods sold they mention in the question post this is in cost of goods sold okay so we're done with this asset value what is the asset value in the balance sheet so this is the asset value in the balance sheet this is the sfp okay the next thing is that we have a plant and equipment having cost of 27100 having accumulated depreciation of 9100 so what is the carrying amount the plant's carrying amount brought forward carrying amount is 18000 cost minus depreciation and the treatment is that there is 15% per annum using the reducing balance method. So what is the depreciation? It's simply 15%. And that is 2700 depreciation. So what is the carrying amount after depreciation? It's 18,000 minus 2700. So my balance sheet value is 15,300 against the plant and total depreciation this is depreciation again charged in cost of goods sold so the above depreciation 1900 and this one 2700 so my total depreciation is 1900 plus 2700 that is 4600 that would be part of cost of goods sold so adjustment is not that much difficult if you have a good understanding of the relevant accounting standard now let's focus on the next one that is the is 38 intangible asset in is 38 we have to deal with two types of intangible assets which is one is purchased other is internally generated and for that different measurement criteria recognition criteria are given for purchase assets you can recognize an initial measurement is at cost and subsequent measurement can we use revaluation model for that? Is it permitted to use the revaluation model? Is it possible to find out the market value of intangible asset? As per IS 38, as per IS 38, the subsequent measurement principle is same as IS 16. That is the cost model and revaluation model. But then why, why, but then why revaluation model is given? We don't use. Reason is that it's very difficult to find out the price and revaluation model in order to opt for revaluation model. The market value must be determined through an active market rather than the through the estimation process and it's very difficult very uncommon very uncommon 
to have a market for the intangible assets. But where they do exist, we can opt for revaluation model. And as a result, the same treatment, there might be some revaluation surplus, or there might be some revaluation deficit. The treatment of revaluation, whether it's IS 16 or IS 38, it's copy paste. It's same. There is no difference. But the frequency of revaluation is very least likely in case of intangible asset. Another thing, the internally generated asset. You know that internally generated assets are difficult to recognize in the balance sheet because a proper value is very difficult to assign. So the IS 38 says that internally generated brand publishing titles, goodwill, and other similar items, copyrights, sorry, customer uh, list, other similar type items. What to do with that? If these are internally generated, what to with what to do with that? With that, you have to. If there is any expense incurred on that, you have to recognize it in profit and loss account as an expense. You cannot capitalize these expenses. But in case of the research and development cost, the treatment is different. The research is having a different treatment. If you have incurred research expense, it is to be charged in profit and loss account as an expense in the period in which that research has been conducted. If you are putting more money on that, that is the development expenditure, then what to do? The development expenditure there are two possible treatments. One says the same as research and the other says that it is to be capitalized and booked as an asset in the statement of financial position. Now you have to apply the recognition criteria. And that says that if you are sure about the future economic benefit, the cost can be reliably measured. Your intention is to complete the process. Your ability is to complete the process. You have sufficient adequate resources available. I hope you have, yes, that same criteria. You know the criteria. It's very easy. The cost can be reliably measured. The future economic benefits are probable. The intention, the ability, and the technical resources. So if they do meet the criteria, it is an asset. Otherwise, it is to be charged in profit and loss account as an expense. Once it has been charged in profit and loss expense, you cannot adjust it subsequently. But if that has been capitalized, then subsequently you have to start amortization of development. And once the production process has been commenced, then you will start amortizing that. And usually what method we use for amortization? We use the straight line method. Fine. Now in the same question, which I just did with respect to revaluation, say, let's see we have something about the research and development as well. So we have research and development cost note number two, and there is a combined value that is 7,800. Now if you go down, M commenced a research and development project on 1st January, 2015. My year end is 30th June 2015. It is spent 1 million per month 
on research until 31st March 2015. So that means January, Feb, and March. Three month expenditure is three million. Okay, three thousand. What is the accounting treatment? I have to show this as an expense in profit and loss account. The first three month research cost. Afterward. it has entered into the development stage okay from this date it is spent 1.6 million per month until june 15 at which date development was complete so from march end that is april may and june we have spent 1.6 million each however it was not until may first may that the directors were confident that a new product would be a commercial success so it means no 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 it means from first may to 30th june that is the two months one is to be capitalized while after march that is one month expense is development expense and it is to be charged in profit and loss account so it means total four month expense is to be charged in profit and loss account and the remaining two months is to be charged is to be capitalized as a deferred development expenditure am i right and those expense one would be charged in cost of sales so not a difficult adjustment but still i need to put some working on that so what is to be charged in cost of goods sold is my first 3 month research expense that is 1000 multiply by 3 that is 3000 the first month development expenditure that is 1600 so 4800 is expense for the year okay and what about the deferred one the deferred one is about 16 into 2 that is 3200 do we need to amortize it right now as it the as it is the year end value so from the next year we will try to amortize it on the basis of useful life okay so nothing much in intangible asset other than that so let's forward is 36 impairment loss not a difficult standard so i'll just go through it within 5 minutes what it's uh, all about and uh, so let's have some let's discuss one mtq with respect to this non current assets or like that Okay. So there was a past paper question, a very good one. The name of the question is flight line. If you get the chance, try to use the original past paper question, not the one that has been given in the kit which I am using right now. The original one is quite good question. one of the most difficult question of ia 16 the question name is flight line right now i'm doing the mtq they have given this in the mtq in the kit so i'm good i'm solving this mtq flight line is an airline which treat its aircraft as complex non current asset what is the definition of complex non current asset under ia 16 how to deal with complex non current asset 
normally we take an example of aircraft normally we 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 take an example of aircraft ship and that type of asset having different components and each component is is having a separate useful life now here we have a aircraft that has been accounted for under the cost model if details are given below interior cabin fittings installed on 1st april 2005 total cost 25000 estimated life 5 years then we have the engine installed at 1st april 9000 is the cost 36000 flying hours we have a depreciation method called the machine hour method or the production unit method so we have to use that in the year ended 31st march 2009 that means after few years the aircraft flew for 1200 hours for the 6 months to 30th september 2008 means from 1st april 2008 till 30th september 2008 it flew for 1200 hours on 1st october the aircraft suffered a bird strike accident which damaged the engine beyond repair and this was replaced by a new engine with a life of 36000 flying hours at a cost of 10.8 million the air end is march 2003 the original question was something very very dif different one and this is the very uh, the, the easy part of that question what is the first requirement what is the depreciation charged in respect of the engine for the 6 month period to 1st october 2008 before it has suffered with a bird strike accident so its cost is 9000 its total hours is 36000 it flew for 1200 hours so 9000 divided by 36000 multiply by 1200 so it will give you a figure of 3000 okay is my figure is correct okay the next one is which of the following explain the correct accounting treatment of the engine so they are saying that right of the damaged engine capitalize the new one and depreciate over 24000 flying hours is it correct why 24000 flying hours why not 36000 next treat the 10.8 million replacement cost as a repair and continue to depreciate the engine as in the first 6 month no there is a new asset this cost has to be capitalized capitalize 6 million to replace the engine expense the other 4.8 million as an expense why not a good treatment right of the damaged engine to capitalize the new one and depreciate over 36000 flying hours this is the correct treatment next one a wing was also damaged but was repaired at a cost of 3 million the accident also caused cosmetic damage to the exterior of the craft which required repainting at a cost of 2 million how to deal with these two what about the repair element a repair is a expense 
What about the repainting of the exterior? I think it's an expense too. Because repainting is, if the repainting is uh, on the new asset or the first time, then its cost is to be capitalized. Otherwise, always charged as an expense. Okay, the next one. As the aircraft was out of service some weeks due to the accident, flight line took the opportunity to upgrade its cabin facilities at a cost of 4.5 million. This did not increase the remaining life of the cabin fittings, but the improved facilities enabled flight line to increase the fares. What is the carrying amount of the fittings as at 31st March 2009? So we have fittings value above. 1st April to, to 25,000, remaining life is five years. And they are asking about the carrying amount at 31st March. So 1st April 25,000. So it's 1st April. 2005, it's 25,000. Life remaining five years. What to do with this 4.5 million? We need to capitalize or expense out. We have to add this in the cost of the asset. So as a result, the remaining amount, the depreciation would be so originally the value was uh, 25,000 and all this has happened on uh, 1st October, the damage was done on 1st October. So it means, can you calculate the depreciation? How much is the depreciation? First of all, identify the cabin fittings value at the time of damage. That is the 1st October 2008. Okay. So at this date, we have uh, 6, 7, and 8. 6, 7, and eight, what is the exact value? How much life has been passed? So from 1st April to 31st March, 2006, one year, 2007, second year, and then 2008, third year, and then the six month. So it's 3.5 years. So need to assess 3.5 years depreciation, 25,000 divided by five multiplied by 3.5. What is the depreciation value? What is the depreciation value? 17,500. So deduct this from so we have carrying amount 17,500. So we have carrying amount of 7,500, right? Then there is an upgradation. So add in the upgradation cost 4,500. So we have 12,000 asset value after upgradation. What is the remaining life left? 1.5 years. So six month depreciation is 18 months multiplied by six. Correct me if I'm wrong. So what is the depreciation? 
depreciation is 4000 so the carrying amount is now 12000 minus 4000 carrying amount is 8 million that means the answer is b okay okay let's move ahead in the last part in the last part the bird strike accident represents an indication of impairment is it true is it true that bird strike accident is an indication of impairment there are two types of indicators of impairment. One is the internal indicator, other is the external indicator. You must have heard about it. There are few assets which need to be impaired annually without looking for the indicators. Yes, this is an indicator. It suggests that you have to compare your carrying amount with your recoverable amount. How you can calculate recoverable amount is the higher of two values, right? So the aircraft will be impaired if it's dash carrying amount exceed its recoverable amount. Option is replacement cost, fair value less cost to sell, carrying amount and value in use. Okay. Can you solve this question with regards to impairment loss? Try this. IS 36 contains a number of examples of internal and external events which may indicate the impairment of an asset in accordance with this which of the following would definitely not to be an indicator of the potential impairment of a group of asset or a single asset an unexpected fall in the market value of one or more asset is this an indicator fall in the price of an asset yes it's an indicator it's an internal indicator. A significant changes in the technological environment. Yes, it's an indicator. Now there are B and C option left. Adverse changes in the economic performance of the asset. Yes, it's an indicator. So what, what we have left with just one option. What is that? The carrying amount of an entity's net assets below its market capitalization when carrying amount is more than its market capitalization then so answer is this d d is the correct answer okay let's have another question with regards to cash generating generating unit you must have an idea about the cash generating unit that if you're not able to find out the impairment in isolation, then you have to find out the cash generating unit, which is, which is the smallest identifiable group of asset. The accountant is decided it's too difficult to reliably attribute cash flows to this one machine and that it would be more accurate to calculate impairment in the basis of factory as a cash generating unit. In accordance with IS 36, which two of the following are true regarding cash generating unit. A cash generating unit to which goodwill has been allocated should be tested for impairment every five year. Is there any requirement regarding every five year? No, there's no such requirement. 
a cash donating unit must be a subsidiary of the parent no no such requirement is there there is no need to consistently identifying cash donating unit based on the same type of asset from period to period what about this the fourth one is right a cash generating unit is the smallest identifiable group of asset for which independent cash flows can be identified this is the definition of cash generating unit fifth one is asset in a cash generating unit should never be impaired below their carrying amount yes it's fine you cannot reduce below now what is c there is no need to consistently identify there is need to identify so it means answer is d and e now let's see another question with respect to cash generating unit impairment is an easy topic so not frequently been examined in the final account question but sometimes they do ask with uh, with refer to is 38 or is 36 sometimes there might be a 10 mark question on is 36 38 and 16 mixed together get ready for that on 1st july 2007 it is discovered that the damage to the machine is worse than originally thought the machine is now considered to be worthless and the recoverable amount of the factory as a cash generating unit is estimated to be 950000 this is the recoverable amount and the carrying amount is including goodwill is 1170 so carrying amount is 1170 the recoverable amount is 950 how much is the impairment loss that is 220 now do you know the order of allocation of the impairment loss uh, in the cash generating unit first against the damage asset then against the goodwill and then on the other assets which are subject to impairment okay which are subject to impairment means if someone is not able to be impaired or it's already having value that is not subject to impairment okay so in this example we have a building subject to impairment we have a plan and equipment including the damage machine at a carrying amount of 35000 we have goodwill we have net current asset at recoverable amount already so in accordance with is 36 what will be the carrying amount of the plan and equipment when the impairment loss has been allocated to the cash generating unit so you need to identify first of all how much is the impairment loss and then you need to identify then how it is to be charged so first against the damage asset okay so first against the damage asset how much is the impairment loss 220 first against the damage asset then against the goodwill 85 what is the remaining impairment loss left it's 100 so the remaining is to be charged against not against goodwill already zero not against net current assets already at the recoverable amount so we have left with 500 building and 300 of undamaged plant so the plant share of this is plant value is 300 out of 800 impairment loss is 100 so how much to recognize against the plant how much to recognize against the plant i'm asking about against the plant 37.5 so this is 37.5 so the remaining value of plant is 37.5 the remaining value of plant is 262.5 am i right 
So this is the answer. 260 to 500. So I hope up till now you are fine that this the uh, discussion is is quite helpful. Now let's have one more adjustment with regard to final account before concluding today's session. Now you can see here, this is the final account question, the same one. You can see here we have uh, investment income, we have equity shares, we have 5% loan notes, right? We have financial assets, equity investment at fair value, which is 8,800, 1st 8 July 2014. Let's see. The tax adjustment. Let's see the tax adjustment. Is there any tax adjustment in the trial balance? Can you find out any tax adjustment in the trial balance? I guess there's nothing. Neither the current tax adjustment nor the defer tax. So let's focus on the adjustment alone. Adjustment says that a provision for current tax is estimated to be 1.2 million. So what is the impact expense debit and liability credit? So tax expense is 1.2 million tax liability is 1.2 million together with an increase in the defer tax provision to be charged in profit and loss account of 8,000. So it means we have 1.2 million of current tax expense. We have increase in defer tax liability. So an expense of 800,000 is to be recognized in profit and loss account. Together we have 2,000 of expense, which is to be recognized in profit and loss account. Very simple adjustment. Now see the loan adjustment. We have a loan note, which is 5% loan note, point number four, having value 20,000. Now see the adjustment. What's wrong with this? The 5% loan note was issued on 1st July at its nominal value of 20 million, incurring direct issue cost of 500,000, which have been charged to admin expense. What is the mistake? We did it before that expense which need to be adjusted with the initial value has been charged in profit and loss account is an expense. So we have to reverse this expense, admin expense credit and liability debit. So I have to deduct this uh, expense from the 20 million value. So 20 million minus 500,000, am I right? So it's 19.5 million. Now, as a result of this, the loan note will be redeemed after three years at a premium having effective finance cost of 8% per annum. Annual interest was paid in 30th June 2015. So 20 million into 5%. This is the interest cost that we have to pay. So there might be some problem with the interest cost as well. Loan note interest and dividend paid. So we have recognized the paid amount. Rather, we have to charge the finance cost using the effective rate. So what do you have to do? You have to perform a calculation of the amortized cost. You need to find out the finance cost at the effective rate of interest. Okay. So let, let me do some working for that. Let's see the initial value. Let's put this initial value first. So the par value is 20 million. Deduct the issue cost. It's uh, 500. So we have initial value 9,500. Okay. Add finance cost using the effective rate. 
that is the eight percent. How much is the finance cost? One five six zero. Deduct interest paid using the coupon rate, which is twenty thousand into five percent, and that is one thousand. Deduct one thousand. It's one thousand is in trial balance, already recorded. So what is the value? What is the closing value? Two double zero six zero. This is the balance sheet value. The liability portion in the balance sheet. This is the amount to be shown in profit and loss account. Right now we have quoted one thousand. Okay. So what adjustment we have to put? If I will ask your journal entry for that, five sixty increase in finance cost, increase in finance cost, five sixty. Okay, and we have to reverse the admin expense of five hundred thousand as well. Reverse the admin expense by five hundred. Liability is reported in trial balance at twenty thousand. So we need to adjust all these together. One entry will correct all these things. Liability is now two double zero six zero. So I have to increase the liability. So liability credit by sixty. Am I right? Finance cost is to be debit by five sixty. Admin expense, which is debit by mistake, so you have to credit admin expense by five hundred. Let's have a double entry. So this is the correction. 